everybody uh, who's watching. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, thank you for joining us uh, tonight for the priced out panel with the ferret. Um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and we have a we have a good night ahead for you. Um, now, my name is Sam Gonsalves. I'm the digital engagement editor for the ferret. If you don't know the ferret. Um, we are an independent investigative news platform uh, looking into issues in Scotland and beyond. Um, one of the issues that we've been looking at this week is we're kind of in the middle of a collaboration with the Herald on a series around the cost of living crisis. Now, we've been looking on different days at different issues like housing, food, energy, and then we have a couple more days to go. And what we wanted to do tonight was bring a few experts to talk about these issues, um, not just talk about the crisis, not just talk about how how we can get sad watching the news and then how horrible things can be, but actually thinking about what is happening on the ground, you know, and what is the response being to uh, to some of the issues that we've been talking about this week? Um, what is the future looking like? What is lived experience of those issues actually like? Um, and yeah, how we can move forward. So I'm excited to bring you, to introduce you to the panel. Before I do, uh, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, you will be able to comment um, and then like wherever you are, you can comment and we'll see the comments here. So if you have any questions throughout the night, feel free to put your questions on those comments, comment boxes, and we may bring them up on screen and talk, talk about them um, as a group. So feel free to ask your questions. We're not going to have a, a specific question kind of thing at the end. Um, so feel free to just kind of throw your questions um, as we go. So um, let's get to our panel just now. Um, we have three experts here to talk about um, their insight into our investigations and into the issues that they raised. Um, first up, we have KT Gallagher-Swan, who's a policy coordinator for the joint project between Boston University Global Development Policy Center and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development on supporting a green and just transition of the world economy. We have Jackie Close from the Deep Fairness Commission, who has led third sector projects for over 25 years with a focus on poverty and inequality. And we have Satvat Rahman, Chief Executive of the One Parent Family Scotland, which is a leading charity working with single parent families in Scotland, providing expert advice, practical support, and campaigning with parents. So I'm going to bring them up on the stream just now. Hello, folks. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, we, we already... Before we started, we've already had the conversation about everyone's Zoom backgrounds and stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that uh, for <laughs> for the viewer. You don't need to take part in that one. Um, so I guess I just want to start with a big general question: Is we've we've had these investigations over the last three days. We've had some revelations around housing, around food, around energy. Did anything stand out to you, to any of you? Any any insights, anything that it made you feel reading that or anything that you want to bring up before we start? Yeah, I would say that it was really apparent that um, those who already have money and own a business or, you know, big business or own property are actually you know, they are increasing their income as opposed to the rest of us whose income in real terms is going down. So I, it was really apparent reading it that actually, you know, yeah, those who've got money are making more money right now and almost abusing the rest of us um, a, a, as a way of manipulating and, and, and making sure that they maximise the income from the market. And it's appalling. It's, it's really appalling across the board. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I can just come in there, I would completely agree with what Jackie said. I thought it was very timely to have this mm -hmm. series now. Um, it's sobering to read um, and it really shows the need for action. But I think what's, um, what's really important is to look what's behind it, that this is not something that's come out of in the making. And we know it is. And it's for some of those reasons that Jackie's spoken about. Actually, what we've got is a crisis of inequality. Mm -hmm. And that's income inequality, wealth inequality, resource inequality. We've got a crisis of poverty mm. and we've got a crisis because of how we are structuring the economy and what we're viewing as being important within that. And that is, it's around wealth accumulation for the few at the expense of the many. 
And, you know, I was at a meeting earlier today, just very briefly, where we were looking at what do we need to do to support families to flourish and thrive? But it's actually all what we're doing at the moment is supporting families Mm. to survive Mm. and exist. Yeah, this will yeah. we'll have someone come. Ali from the fair is going to come in a little later to tease <laughs> the next couple of days of investigations. But it, the income thing, it, it, like tomorrow, the theme is going to be wages, yeah. and and so mm-hmm. the the living wage and all of that is like a really interesting point that I want to go back on. Um, but before I move on, Katie, were you going to say were you going to say something? I mean, I, I I would agree with what both Jackie and Satvat said. You know, the the pandemic surfaced. The persistent inequalities mm-hmm. of all sorts that pervade their society and you know in response advanced economies pumped more than 17 trillion dollars you know into the into stimulus mm. and that did nothing really to change the dynamics of inequality in our society you know we have not done anything near what's necessary to attack these structural imbalances and it amounts to an attack on working classes you know we you can call it any other thing but that is what it is when billionaires in, in the year of the pandemic made increased their wealth by 3.9 trillion dollars and working people lost earnings of 3.7 trillion dollars that's a, a wealth transfer to the wealthy people in society and Scotland is no different this is what this series shows whether it's food or fuel mm-hmm. or housing these profits are being rooted in a as Jackie said, the already wealthy asset owners, well, regular people are squeezed further and further. Yeah. Well, let's go back a little bit on what you were t- what were you saying, Satvat, on the on the on the roots of all of this and and, mm-hmm. and where it comes from. Um, is it the case that, that that we're talking about this this cost of living crisis now because it's been a very eventful few years of pandemic, Brexit, mm-hmm. or was there something there before and we weren't seeing the roots and now it's starting to show? I think, as um, Katie said, all what the pandemic did really was shine a light on inequalities Mm -hmm. that have already been there. Um, I've been working for One Parent Family Scotland now for 11 years, and poverty has been a persistent Mm -hmm. theme Mm -hmm. in the work that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying it's, you know, it's not new. I just think it is, it's intensified. Right. What mm-hmm. we're seeing is an intensification of an experience, and mm-hmm. what we are seeing is um, destitution, in a way, and on levels we've not seen before. I mean, you know, the the article around housing and getting mm-hmm. people to bid, you know, mm-hmm. outbid each other for rents and things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. shocking, but actually, as a result of a, the way we've structured our housing market and the lack of investment in social Mm. housing and Mm. renewing social housing stock, you can see how there have been the structural causes for it. Can I just say, I just wanted to bring in the voices of some of the parents I'm working with, if that's okay. And I've got a couple of quotes here, Mm -hmm. which I just thought generally really summed up where we are in terms of the cost of living crisis. And there's one parent who said, I feel I'm out there working for nothing. Thank goodness for food parcels, which allow me more money for my gas and electric. I don't know how I will manage when it goes up in April. I'm worried mm-hmm. sick. Right. Another one. I have already having to turn, sometimes turn off the heating, even when it's really cold, to ensure we have enough electric to do until I next get paid. I even sometimes have to put items into cash converters on buyback to buy more electric. Mm-hmm. These are two working parents. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, Jackie, does that connect? You, the the Fairness Commission has been working throughout the pandemic yeah. and, and before, and the Food Security yeah. Network as well that you're involved with. D- d- does that connect with what you're hearing as well and on the ground? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. I think um, I, 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 so I would say about 10 years ago, I remember visiting a family in Paisley. And I remember going to this woman's house and she was a single parent with two children and she had no carpets, she had no curtains, you know, she was really struggling on the income she had at that point. So this is not new, but it is worse. And what we've seen is increasing numbers of people pushed pushed into poverty and increasing numbers of people who were already in poverty pushed into destitution. 
we're seeing housing stock reducing in quality. So um, the, the Fairness Commission that, that we have facilitated for, we, we facilitated two over the last five years, and that has involved people who, for whom this is their lived experience. And during the pandemic, we looked particularly at fuel and food poverty and, and food insecurity. And um, we went and spoke to people living in, in a particular area in Dundee. And the thing that they talked about was they were part of a district heating scheme, which was great, mm -hmm. but they had gaps around their doors and windows. So they basically said, it just all goes straight out the window. So so we're, we're needing to look at, there's so many infrastructure issues that are there that mm -hmm. it's, it's really frightening. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of, of numbers, um, so, so we've been supporting around um, 26 to 30 food projects across Dundee. We brought them all together at the beginning of the pandemic. And at the worst point in the pandemic, there was about four and a half thousand people in Dundee alone, and we're a small city, accessing emergency food. Now, over the last two years, that's changed and we're still coordinating this network and we've moved to more dignified approaches, moving away from uh, a kind of food bank approach to, to, to this because people need their dignity and, yeah. and that sense of self. But what, and what we found was the numbers dropped and reduced as they should, but never below a thousand every week accessing food support that's now gone back up and we've seen a rapid increase in the last two to three months and we're back up to two and a half thousand reaching three thousand a week and that's 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 before we hit the first of april so there's real concern about what's coming next for families for individual for older people for single people it's it's really concerning yeah yeah um yeah katie Sure. Um, you know, I'm going to be the person uh, this evening that I think persistently tries to point outwards from Scotland as well, you know, because mm -hmm. I think um, what, we're ex what working people are experiencing in Scotland is being replicated in, in different parts of the world right now. And so to understand the inflationary pressures that are pushing up all these prices and, and making people's lives harder to afford, I think we also need to, to be looking beyond our borders and all. And, you know, mm. when we talk about roots of, of the crises and, the, you know, the events that have been happening, you know, I think that we may misdiagnose, you know, these events if we don't understand them as having interconnected roots. You know, whether we're talking about, you know, prolonging the pandemic, the fact that we're still in the pandemic right now, as much as some people would like to believe otherwise, you know, more than 10,000 people are still dying every day from the pandemic globally, which is more than at the beginning of, of uh, 20, 2020, is it now? God, I've lost that. Yep. Whether we're talking about, you know, the rise of the far right, whether we're talking about the advance of climate change, and whether we're talking about the war in Ukraine, you know, mm. each of these crises can be connected to the imbalance and abuse of power, and each of them are connected to these inflationary pressures. So this isn't to say, oh, it's all, all structural, because we need accountability for the few okay. people who are responsible right. for these crises. But unless we see and connect these systemic linkages, we're going to have no hope of overcoming them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting about the story that gets told around the cost of living crisis or other things or the pandemic or whatever. Um, earlier today, one of the fair reporters, Paul Dobson, was doing a, a live with the Herald, and he mentioned some some voices that were that were starting to say, "Is it connected? Is the the, the kind of cost of living increase connected to Ukraine? And you know, and is that connected to the Russia Ukraine conflict?" And Maybe we just need to make some sacrifices now because it's a difficult time in history, you know, or whatever. So it, there is a there is an element of storytelling that happens, I suppose, of where the roots are and, and who is responsible and who isn't. Does that make sense? Just just to quickly come back on that, you know, yeah. it's it's a common adage to say, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. But that goes for all sides of the political right. spectrum. So of course. <laughs> People like Nigel Farage are out saying we need to go for more oil. And of course, mm -hmm. people are saying we need to invest more in weapons. None of these things take people out of poverty. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. None mm -hmm. of these things take people out of poverty. So yeah. rooting more money into the profiteering hands mm -hmm. of oil mm -hmm. companies or weapons companies, mm -hmm. that is not going to help people's living standards increase. But mm -hmm. I, I think that that's a diversion. And I think, 
you know, those of us who, who are interested in, in ensuring that we all have an equitable future that is, you know, that achieves a just transition and where mm. peace exists, you know, globally, um, we have to rebut and continually rebut those those excuses that make us, you know, go down a road like that. And often at the end of the day, put the interests of working people here against the interests of working people everywhere. Absolutely. When that is never going to liberate anybody. Absolutely. I also though think it's very easy to sit back and say, do we just need to, you know, accept these hardships when you're actually not experiencing yeah. those hardships, do you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and I think that is one of the things that is key to this whole conversation is that it isn't about them and us, you know, and actually we can come on to talk about that later in terms of what we can do and how we can report on it, etc. in a way that stops it being that. But, you know, it's the fact that the ONS did something yesterday, which I I didn't click on the first tweet, which was all about how are you faring compared to others or something, depending on where you're living. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. But I started scrolling through through their Twitter thread to see what else were there. And there was some, there were some excellent graphs in there. I mean, very depressing, but excellent in terms of this is coming from the ONS. You know, I can say this is coming from OPFS and that doesn't necessarily carry the same weight mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. saying it comes from someone who's, you know. And they were saying people, they were talking about who who lacked a financial buffer to sustain overspends as a result of some of the things that are coming the way, our way. And it was single adults and single parents mm -hmm. who right. lack, you know, the buffer to sustain mm -hmm. their overspend. They also asked about um, rates of poverty. Mm. And if I just look at parents, for example, they spoke in terms of income poverty, spending poverty, and financial wealth poverty. They looked right. at each of those individually and then combined the three. And in terms of households with children, for example, 31% of lone parent households with children were in poverty in all three of those categories, right? right? Compared with 13% of households that were couple households with children mm -hmm. so there is something here also about how we structure our society mm -hmm. and what we expect the family unit to be right, right, and therefore yeah. that taking some of the sort of burden because there was also a report i think it was yesterday by child poverty action group which looked at the cost of raising a child mm -hmm. and how right. it's increasing over time right. and again there you see that um in a couple family the cost of raising a child over the lifetime of the child including child care cost is 160,000 mm. a single parent family to 190,000 right gotcha. so you're seeing families who mm. are at the greatest risk of poverty mm. and inequality in all ways who are now being hardest hit by this crisis that we're mm -hmm. seeing coming because there are no buffers there yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't yeah. think we can accept people saying, oh, this is just one of those consequences mm. of global yes. structural changes and inequalities. I think we yeah. need to look to see what we can do about it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. it, it'll be interesting to hear from your perspective as well, Jackie, because it's uh, not only were you working with the Fairness Commission before, you know, when you, before pandemic or before the Russian invasion mm. of Ukraine mm. or before any of these things that could be used as excuses, but you also... Um, you know, there's an element there of then the being in a tough spot in terms of food mm. poverty, in terms of mm. other kind of key key issues being faced by by people who live in the city. Um, we know each other. I lived in Dundee for for many years. And how how does this conversation resonate with you around causes and around what was already there and what's been mm. exacerbated and all of that? Yeah. I mean, I would say that, I mean, that there's, <clears throat> I think what I'm seeing is, as I said before, is the, is the number of people who are now facing poverty and, and, and inequality in a way that, that was not there before. But I think the, the biggest issue for me, just kind of reflecting back on, on what Katie and Satvat have said, is actually where does the power lie? And I, for, for me, the power lies with the big businesses. Who holds the money in the world? It's the big businesses. They hold the money. And they have more control 
over what happens than we think they do. Mm. Um, and so if the big businesses who are still mopping up and, and making billions and billions of dollars every year, despite all of these challenges, are the ones that are then quietly or not so quietly controlling various governments or or quietly, you know, making sure that governments understand that, that more finance is coming their way if they uh, favour them in, in different ways um, around tax or around uh, allowing them to get away with the way that they uh, pay their staff. I mean, the bottom line of what we need is we need better income. So although the cost of living is increasing, it's increasing for all of us, but what we're seeing is that uh, the income is not increasing at the same rate. In fact, income, even in in, in uh, real terms, even if somebody's income goes up, it's not going up at the same rate as the cost of living. Right. So what we're seeing in Dundee is um, an increasing number of people who are either um, on benefits or working on, on low incomes. And in real terms, they are losing far more than the rest of us. So, you know, if we are, you know, I'm in full-time work, as is my husband, we're in a position where we are seeing chunks of our money, you know, a big chunk of, of, of our money disappearing because of the rising cost, but it's not proportionate. It's not proportionate to those who are on lower incomes because they are facing the same rise, but their incomes are so much lower and they don't have, as, as Satvat said, they do not have those resources mm. around them People don't have savings. They don't have family who can bail them out or help them. And they don't have the option of increasing their hours or moving to another job or going to a job that's better paid or moving up. And this is one of the things we've identified in Dundee and I think in the last 10 years through the Fairness Commissions was that actually, and it might have been the one that Satvat was involved in, was actually what you have now, and this is across the board, not just in Dundee, is you've got entry-level jobs. You've got managers' jobs. Now, in the past, what we had was steps two. So you would maybe have a supervisor jobs and a trainee or assistant manager or something. That's gone. And, and what happens is people come in at entry level jobs or that management level jobs and there's no route up. So people are trapped. They're, they're trapped at a point where there is their income cannot increase. Um, yeah. So what I would say is, is the Scottish government through Social Security Scotland have tried to mitigate some of that um, by increasing the number of benefits they have um, available for families. Um, but single single individuals, Satvat was mentioning single adults living on their own. No, there's 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 just nothing. Mm -hmm. These are the people that I'm seeing moving towards destitution. Um, and it's it's really quite concerning. Yeah, I want to bring you started by by talking about the people responsible or where where does where do we put guilt or where do we put kind of responsibility for that? I want to bring that question uh, to you, Katie and Satwat. Who, who are the villains here? Who are who are the bad guys in these stories? Is there who would you point to? I mean, I would agree with what Jackie's saying. You know, of the ultimately they're they're there's a very clear trade-off being made here, right? Um, there's a prioritization of profits over public interests, but these private interests have their enablers. And I think we have to think about responsibility at different tiers and, and connect them. There's cronyism at every level of governance and Scotland is, is not excused from that. So there is the local and national responsibility of those who would, you know, prefer to have more regressive approaches to to recovering from the pandemic and as an example i think that the the, the economic transformation strategy that was released last week is an example of a race to the bottom chasing foreign investor strategy which is not going to deliver for scottish workers and this idea that entrepreneurship is going to save us all and help us all pull ourselves up by our bootstraps that doesn't work <laughs> or, or, or at least it might work for a few people but systemically nationally to beat these deep inequalities that's going to preserve the inequalities rather than tackle them and then I think you know there is the conservatives at the UK level we we have to acknowledge that the monetary power is is with the with at the UK level it's not a devolved thing as is foreign policy and so the fact that the Bank of England is is raising interest rates of course that is going to bring with it you know as in an attempt to to to, to tackle inflation that is going to emphasize these cost of living issues and it's 
fundamentally an attack on the poor, you know, and, and we've seen repeatedly during the pandemic, we pumped trillions of pounds into stimulus. And who did that go to? It went to the people who already had, you know, it went to, 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 to corporates that didn't really have a uh, much responsibility, you know, as we've seen in 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 the investigations uh, from the Fed this week, it, it, these subsidies went to corporates who have no real responsibility to to respect their workers, to in, in, ensure productive investment, to create more jobs. None of those requirements were put on that money that was released. But then I think we also need to connect that to a, a global economic architecture. And I'll, I'll probably continue to beat this drum because it's a global economic architecture that incentivizes that sort of policy making. And so the power of states, you know, at the end of the day, to be able to govern in the interest of your public, it is constrained by the fact that, you know, since you know, the 80s, since the Thatcher and Reagan era, we have seen the power of global finance increase and the power of state to regulate and the interests of the public decrease, which does mean that there are threats to states to be able to take the, the measures that they need to, to be able to sort of ensure and, and that, that everybody can have a job, have prosperity. That's not to let anybody off the hook. I'm just saying that there is an interconnected system here. And, and unless we see it in this more globally connected way, then, then we won't be able to frame or understand the, you know, the the, the failures of the Scottish government or the failures of the the UK government. Yeah. Absolutely, and if I can just come in on the back of that, I think it even sort of like um, sort of like the bigger contest te text is actually what we have is an economic system where inequality isn't a byproduct; it's central to it. Do you know, it's the way it operates part of the raison d'etre of it and so what we are we are going to see inequality until we begin to have those bigger conversations that Katie's spoken about but in terms of some of the things that are causing this particular crisis I agree completely with Jackie and Kate, Katie that we need to be doing more to hold um, employers corporations etc to account in terms of the the pay and the conditions of staff and the lack and and you know even even where a progression route might exist there is no investment in individuals do you know right. there is no investment in the workforce to do that right. and i'm hoping the fact that there are so many crises in um recruitment happening across various sectors should also be something that we see as an opportunity to be able to look to see how do we restructure some of these jobs and actually mm -hmm. you know some of what i've been hearing is that employers who are paying the real living wage as a minimum aren't having the same difficulties recruiting people right. employers who are valuing their workforce aren't having the same difficulties retaining people they were you know so in some ways it's an opportunity for us to look yep. to see how can we use this to reshape things in terms of um, employment? I wish I could say that we would have the same opportunity in how we can use it to shape things around social security that's reserved, you know, and get them to operate universal credit by the rate of inflation, at least not by what they're proposing at the moment, to have, you know, not taken away the £20 uplift that was there for families. Some of the small measures that would have helped families be able yeah. to navigate this crisis have been taken away to the, yeah. you know, for the reserve social security system we have. And whilst we can all do what we can to mitigate, it's not the same. We're not going to be able to replace that. So I think that's an additional challenge sure. that we need to look at. Yeah, that's that's a really good point to to <laughs> touch on. I I, I want to get to the part of the evening where we start bringing the nose of the plane up in to, to, to some yes. degree. Um, it's very easy to just get on the like, oh my god, everything is mm -hmm. horrible. Like, but but what are the kind of conversations that that are are happening right now about how we engage with this and how we respond to this? Before I, before we get into that, just just a comment from Gordon. I'll see if I can put it on screen um, that he put on the chat. But the, the kind of basic thing is to what you were saying, Katie, about how do we ensure uh, accountability uh, from government in delivering things like, you know, we were talking about a rent cap um, earlier in the week. Some campaigners from Living Rent are calling for a rent cap in the in the Scottish government. 
know, the Green Coalition has kind of promised to do that, you know, in by 2025, I believe. And so, but there, but there were some concerns about, is it really going to happen? Is it going to be too late? Are they, are they waiting too long? To Gordon's question, how do we ensure that we're keeping uh, policymakers to account? Um, how, how can community kind of community drives, community campaigns ensure that if there is this kind of private interest also there, that's like just as strong. And does anyone want to respond to that? I, I would, I think for, for me, um, mm -hmm. the most important thing is to make sure that the voices of those for whom this is happening to them are at the heart of this. So um, that, that's at the heart of what, what we do. But in the, in the midst of the pandemic in 2020, the Scottish government actually did do quite a lot of reaching out and listening to people for whom this was impacting the most. And what that did was allowed those people to feel like they had some kind of voice and some kind of agency in this, rather than feeling like everything is done to them, that mm. they had some way to express what was happening and express solutions. Um, mm. Because actually the people who have the solutions are those who are living in it. And I think what I would love to see is a way that the, the, the policy makers in a real way, and I don't mean, you know, it can be tokenistic and tick box, but actually in a real way, engage with people for whom this is their lived experience, you know, whether that's um, uh, single parent families, whether that's um, individual adults, if they're the ones that are being hit the hardest, people with disabilities, you know, pensioners, let's get them round the table and not just in a one-off, but actually sitting with the policymakers in a real meaningful way. Some of that we've managed to do in Dundee, some of that we've managed to do with the council, and some of that has allowed um, things to be slightly different and allowed resources to be focused in a way that was better for people in Dundee. But it takes a bit of, it's long term, it can't be single one-off. But I think that can begin to help policymakers really understand where those resources need to go and how they need to be delivered. Just to come in on that, I mean, I, I agree, um, but I also am sick to the back teeth of hearing Scottish government doing a consultation, Scottish government doing a listening exercise, Scottish government, like, when is, I honestly think that it is being used as a cover for an action and as a way to neutralise people who should be able to organise against um, government inaction and so I 100% I, I agree, Jackie. I think that there's issues with centralisation in policy making, but I do think that there's a lot of highfalutin rhetoric around engagement and participation and consultation that goes absolutely nowhere. And I and I, I think it's I think it's terrible. I think it's disgusting because it exploits local people. Mm -hmm. It exploits people in their time, uses up their valuable time just to like suck it into into a useless process that often doesn't lead anywhere and, and so I, I i want to see more accountability for these, these absolutely processes. i want to see the direct delivery from the engagement with communities and, and, and affected people and the policy outcomes i don't want people to be neutralized i think that you know the 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 living rents organizing and unions organizing has been so inspiring because it's been public and it's been shaming this sort of soft cuddling scottish government position and i think that that's really what's necessary i would i was just going to say just following on from that, that in terms of accountability, I think we've got it wrong into, you know, because I mean, I would see the the work Jackie's speaking about being where we go to be held accountable for what we are and aren't doing in terms mm. of actually you've said X, Y and Z, it's made absolutely no difference to my life whatsoever. And this is mm. why not. And I think that that would be really powerful. And again, the families we work with will say time and again. How many times do they want to come and ask me about what the barriers are? I've told them till I'm blue in my face. I want them to come back and tell me what they've done about it and the difference it's going to make to my life. And I think that's what's really critical. But I do also want to say that actually in some ways the pandemic has demonstrated that it is possible to dramatically change how we do things. I know we spent years campaigning um, along with other organisations for local authorities, Scottish government, others to take a cash first approach to how we support families. 
Mm-hmm. Do you know? And it was always a case of, oh, I'm not sure if the money would be spent on the right things or can we really trust them with this and stuff like that. We argued for it strong, long and hard. And actually in the pandemic, what we saw was cash going to families, not enough, not for it to be consistent and make a long dif- long-term difference, but it changed people's mindsets, those with authority and those with power. Do you know, because I don't know if any of you remember near the start, I think it was during the first lockdown when we were looking to see campaigning for there to be something in place of the free school meals family, children had lost as a result. Mm. And you saw all this thing about, well, parents can come and queue and pick up their packed lunches. So, you know, this is when we're all in lockdown, mind. Remember, not meant to leave the house apart from once a day or whatever. <laughs> and actually, that shifted to a cash first approach, which also has key to it things like dignity and respect and giving people the opportunity to make the same choices of what food they will buy for their family the same as we would in terms of what we want to eat but I do think we have to be get a lot better at how we hold politicians to account in terms of at Westminster and here at Holyrood as part of this Um, because in terms of what's you know um, how do we re- sort of respond to it? What some of the potential solutions can be? I think they have to be co-produced through the work that Jack has spoken about. I think people need to be prepared to give up some power as well mm. as a result of this. Otherwise, we're not mm. going to see any fundamental shifts. Yeah, yeah. And I would, I would come in and say, I think you're right. Both, I think. Well, I think I, I'm really enjoying this conversation, and I think um, there's a real need for that fight. There needs to be people who stand up and fight as well as those who are um, being listened to in that tell us the solutions and how do we co-produce this together. But see those ones that are being listened to and how do we co-produce this together? Pay them. Mm -hmm. I think we should be paying them. I don't think we should be saying, we want to hear what you think and then off you go. I think we should be paying people who have that experience to share it because that is their expertise. You might be an expert at writing a policy. You might be an expert at turning that into act, you know, turning that into some kind of service delivery. But see, these people, they're the experts in what will really make a difference. So pay them for it for once instead of just doing it and expecting them to do it for free and to be there just to kind of, you know, kind of pat their heads and say, thanks, that's great. So that's the biggest thing I would love to see change. Yeah, nice one. I mean, we've already started touching on this, but are there any other regenerative ideas out there about how we engage with this crisis like uh, what what have you been talking about getting excited about like what's what are ways that the communities are coming together to 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 change the situation or ways that they should be doing it or yeah i think i the, uh, i i've i've got one that i think is really interesting that i heard yesterday um and this is this is not really changing at, at, at any systemic level. It's about mitigating the impact and finding ways to help people in a day-to-day mm-hmm. way. But <laughs> I heard yesterday that apparently Amazon um, see all the all the returned items, they all go to Fife. And so what, what they're doing in Fife is all those returned items are going to be redistributed to people that need them. <laughs> and the high-end stuff that people don't really want, like fancy coffee machines, they're going to sell them and use that money to get the things that people need. And I was <laughs> like, that it's amazing. So just start returning loads of items that you don't need anymore. <laughs> and it'll go to five. <laughs> I would just, you know, curtains, people need curtains. Um, but it, it was really inspiring last night to speak to folk from Fife and to hear that happening. And, and they were saying, no, that's great. Now, there's a, a gazillion issues with Amazon. So please don't think that's me then saying that's letting them off the hook. But it's those small, innovative ideas that, that just, just soften some of the blow that people are feeling right now and that's what we need to do everything we can to try and soften that blow so 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 the other thing we said last night in this meeting was a you know carpets so you know what keeps you warm in your home if you if you don't have heating is a a good thick carpet and thick curtains i'm pointing at them because they're old (laughs) um, curtains from a a a hotel so they're nice and thick so we were talking about this last night and the need for carpets and lo and behold you so so there was a talk of why don't we approach different companies and and fife and do the same idea have you got any returns any offcuts we'll store them not must personally but a, a group in fife and we'll redistribute them out to, to families who are new or people who are new into the home and needing the carpet 
Today, one of the women that I was in the meeting with was contacted by a local councillor who has 100 rolls of carpet. So, so you, kinda, you couldn't have made it up, but you just think that's all it takes. A little bit of vision. Somebody says, I've got this thing and other people are ready to go with it. So be ready to go. Have ideas. Talk to other people. Listen to what they're saying and say, let's be ready to act on this. Not just sitting there going, someone else will do it. That's a simple thing. But it will make a difference to, to, to lots of people who really need it. I think that's critical, isn't it, in terms of where we are now and what do we do to support people in the crisis they're in? You know, it's. I think that those sort of like community responses, you can't plan for those. You know, it's no point me sitting there and writing a plan to say this is how the community is going to respond and this is going to go. They're organic. They, you know, they're grassroots actions, and I think grassroots action is so important when we're looking at some of the responses to this, and how how that that can then come in together into community action, and community activism because I think that's what's critical as well as part of this. Do you know when um, I was talking about this with colleagues and when it came to the question how do we respond to the crisis as, as individuals, and I kept it here because one had just put with a little smiley face next to it start a revolution. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it. Is the, and but you know what? Revolutions don't have start small. They can start local. It's all those things. It's about um, empowerment, people feeling that they can make a change and a difference to their own lives. And then from that, moving on to how do we make some of that long term structural change so that we're not continually in this cycle? and that people aren't having to live within the circumstances that we've got. And in between that around mitigation, I always think it's about how do we, what can we do to increase income in families and in households? And what can we do to drive down household cost? And that's the critical bit of tonight's conversation because that's what mm. the cost of living crisis is doing is raising all those costs for people. And how can we do it simply? I mean, I thought the whole idea about um, free bus travel for under 22s was great, right? right? Could really help mm. reduce some household costs in families. But boy, was that one complicated, difficult application process to have to do. But halfway through it, you realise that the ID documents were ones that you have to pay for, like a passport or a driver's licence. Many of the families we work with wouldn't have those or have the means mm. to get them. So what we need to do is when we are planning those types of things that are going to reduce costs, we're not building in blocks for those who are they are meant to be helping the most mm. you know by putting together application processes which suit our systems right. but don't suit families yeah. you know I'm, I'm really I'm impressed by the um knowledge of jackie and satwa on these like more local um uh, organizing activities because yeah because i think it is you know building up that solid local solidarity is necessary and then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, obviously we all aspire for a future where those sorts of adaptive and innovative, you know, actions are not necessary. And I think that with this current, you know, cost of living crisis, I think that we need to kind of strap ourselves in for a wee bit because it's going to it's going to be a bit of a long ride. The um, the pandemic is is continuing. The just transition, you know, is is not currently just, and we're so far from, you know, mm. transitioning to a more uh, a, a, a low carbon economy. And and these sorts of fluctuations in price and inflation are going to be coming for the for the foreseeable future, really. Mm. Especially as long as there's an unsynchronized approach to to these sort of global global climate questions. And I think that it's critical that we, you know, organise as quickly as possible to, to, to transform the response to this. Because at the moment, you know, raising interest rates, triggering a recession, that is class warfare. That is an attack on poor people. And so in, in we need to, to, if we don't shift this response fairly quickly, um, then we're in for quite a long ride of these attacks on the poor. And we will see a, a rise in reactionism, a rise in conflict, a rise in instability. And it will be the marginalised people, you know, the working classes that, that suffer. So I think, you know, and, and actually we did a, in my work, we did a, a, a sort of 
a flagship report every year. Last year, our, our one big message was austerity and you know retracting investment is the biggest threat to the global economy right now. It's the biggest threat to global stability. So I, I think that there's three basic things that we need to do rather than increasing interest rates. Number one is we need to stop spending on the stuff we don't need. That means demilitarizing. That means not invest, not giving consultancy fees in the millions to to sort of for for I don't know Boris Johnson to like fix down and decorate Downing Street. You know we need to cut that unnecessary expenditure. We need to increase spending on the fundamentals, on our social safety nets, on our public services, on our care economy, on education. So we need to invest in all of these soft infrastructures that are necessary for us to sustain life. And then, but the third is that we need to we need to replumb the system. We need to tackle these power imbalances in our economic system. I think all of the articles that were released this this week by the Fed, you know, you in each one you see the exploitation of capital screaming at Afri poor people. And that may, we need to, to definancialise de our economy in Scotland and that, that, you know, at the Scottish level, at the UK level, at the global level. But we also do need to introduce price controls so that that profiteering isn't possible. And that is across rent controls, food price controls and energy controls. These are all possible. They've all been done. And it is an act which prioritises the public. It prioritises marginalised people rather than, rather than profit making. Katie, I would vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> Please go into politics. I would vote for you. We need people like you in there who just really want to start the system up and know what you're talking about. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I mean, just, just to this final point that you were making, Katie, I think this might be a good time to bring on Ali, who... Uh, works at the ferret let me put you on the screen here um hello ali welcome um hi everyone so ali's been kind of uh, being the editor manager person leading the kind of priced out investigation uh it's been a really interesting process that actually i don't think people see enough of on the behind the scenes of uh the all the journalists at the, at the ferret kind of working towards different themes and, and kind of looking at different data sets and, and working on on each theme having a uh, each day having a different theme so it's a really kind of interesting package and um i wanted to bring you in to tease a little bit of what's coming in the next couple of days ali but also to ask the question of like what what was the process of of realizing that this is a thing that the ferry should be engaging with like what was the what was the kind of the, the process of getting getting to the first stages of this yeah, well, firstly, I think a lot of the, the reasoning behind why we thought it was such an important thing has been excellently explained already in the last 45 <laughs> minutes. Uh, but um, yeah, well, our, the project we did, uh, obviously a co-partnership with the Herald, uh, it's our third uh, of, of our, these, these um, sort of by, like, we do about four a year of these um, investigations. And the last two were, who runs Scotland and how green is Scotland? So who runs Scotland was looking at... Um, who, who owns various industries in Scotland, who's behind, who, you know, the kind of the, the, the people behind the quangos and the people behind the various different uh, power brokers in the century in Scotland. And the second one was how green is Scotland? So how how does Scotland's like green credentials stack up, particularly around COP26? Uh, um, and we thought, well, all these things are massively important and massively affecting people on the ground, like people in, in Scotland and the UK and how, you know, so these things affect people's uh, rents, they affect people's energy bills, they affect uh, the food prices in shops, they affect, uh, you know, the shop, why shops are closing down, why the high street is uh, collapsing. Um, all these things together with, um, you know, the impact of austerity, which again, are things that have been talked about in this uh, chat already, the, the impact of Brexit, the impact of COVID, the climate crisis, uh, and even, you know, the impact, current impact of Ukraine are all affecting people's lives and all kind of part, um, participating in the cost of living crisis. So, we felt that it was really important to reflect that the cost of living question was, was happening. Also, our readers, uh, we did a survey of our readers, uh, Sam, which uh, you led, which we had hundreds of responses, far more than we expected, of people describing how the cost of living was affecting them. Um, yeah. And uh, in various different ways, in ways which we hadn't really anticipated. And so we felt like it was a, 
a kind of perfect opportunity and a perfect like a, the best time to put together a kind of in-depth uh investigation so five days looking at uh, housing farming energy wages and business uh, and how people are being affected by these things but also a lot of the coverage around cost of living so far has been kind of sometimes we describe it as sort of like tragedy porn where it's people you know it's the going it's going and looking at people looking there who are incredibly you know like you see sad people in front of newspapers you see people there are really extreme cases of people struggling we thought that's obviously the heart of this uh issue but also there's loads of people that are making money on the back of this so yeah. it's you know all these things all these issues we've talked about you know there's house builders letting agents big energy firms companies low-wage companies credit uh, you know loan sharks credit companies whatever you want to call them um are and also these people are being enabled by the inaction of government so mm -hmm. there's a huge sort of snowball effect of all these things and there's not just a lot of people you know huge number of people are being massively screwed over by this but also people are making money off the back of it so we want to look at both the sides of yeah. that point of view. brilliant and can you tease a little bit of what we're going to have in the next couple of days yeah of course uh, so yeah, as I say, so far we've focused on housing, uh, farms, food, and uh, energy. And the next two days, tomorrow is wages. So uh, wages and debt. So essentially, our journalists uh, Karen Goodwin and Petra Matievich did a sort of deep dive into adverts on uh, job sites. So uh, that's the GWP site, and also Indeed, the um, job listing site, and uh, discovered that. Uh, a third of the wages that were being, a third of the jobs that are being advertised had wages which are under the living wage. Um, and there was, you know, many companies were advertising jo jobs that were so, so under the living wage they wouldn't, they couldn't really be performed by people who are over twenty three. You know, it's because they were only for you know, on wages that were so low that they're only for younger people. Um, and also, part time uh, jobs that were part time had an even higher proportion of them were under the living wage. And we know that part time jobs are. Um, disproportionately held by people, you know, for, for women who have other, other you know, um, caring responsibilities by uh, uh, minorities, by people, you know, there's all sorts of things which kind of factor into this, um, which aren't being dealt with. And on uh, Friday, we're looking into uh, business, so that's the high street and uh, small businesses that have been affected by the pandemic and the kind of high street and how that's been uh, sort of decimated. Um, and also things things like post offices and banks and things where they, they close down, leaving people who are already in uh, difficult situations, either financially or because they have accessibility issues or whatever, they're unable to, you know, it really affects their day-to-day -day lives. So that's the next two days um, of our cool. investigation. Yeah, there's some some in interesting stuff coming up and some quotes from people who may or may not be in the Zoom call um, who are also featured featured in there. So, um, yeah, it'll be good to see. Now, uh, we have five, six minutes. I have this promise whenever I do, I do an online event that we always finish on the dot exactly on time that we promise to finish. Uh, so this is a vow that I've kept to myself. Um, in the last five to six minutes, the other thing I very much enjoy is keeping journalists and the media's feet to the fire and holding holding them accountable for how we, we tell these stories, for how we cover issues like the cost of living crisis and equality and so on. So I guess I just wanted to finish on the – and I mean – there's so much that we could have talked about tonight, so I encourage everyone watching to go and follow all the panelists on on social media and to kind of chase chase up their work because there's a lot more. But just to finish, any final thoughts on the coverage of the living cost crisis in the UK? How has it not been good um, in general? How could it be better? How not specifically talking about the ferry, but just talking about how we talk about it in the media in general. Um, what could the media be doing to to talk about this in a better way? Does anyone want to take that up? And Ali, feel free to take that up as well if you like. Uh, I don't mind just saying a couple of things, and then I'm Please. sure colleagues will have other things to say. Um, I think something what Jackie said was really important. There's a lot of research to show when you're talking about issues like this, about the disproportionate impact of the cost of living, um, the war on the poor, the war on 
you know, um, the working class. It helps to focus on the human impact, but in, but in terms of shared values and experiences, not in terms of, um, I call it poverty porn. I think, Ali, you called it something else. Do you know, well, isn't this terrible? Isn't this shocking? And shouldn't we all be giving them a bit of charity type thing? No. And I think that's sort of being able to contextualise that and to look to see what some of the achievable solutions are is really important in terms of how we need to report on this. And as we know human stories have a much bigger impact than statistics, but the statistics are also really, really critically important. Um, but I do think the framing of these is something that we have to be so careful about in terms of when we're looking at these types of issues, because in, in some sections of the mainstream media, it's framed as an issue which is disproportionately affecting poor people because they make poor choices. Do you know? And that's a narrative that has to be challenged and an alternative narrative to that put forward. That actually, this is about a series of structural issues where what we've done is placed the biggest burden of the cost of living crisis on those who we have pushed into the lowest paid, most difficult types of circumstances and have had the safety net of social security taken away. Yeah, yeah I'd agree with that. But I think um, the language that is used is often bl blaming. Um, so it's very subtle, but the way that they talk about people who for whom this is hitting the hardest, it's the way that it's 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 written implies blame. It's their own fault. If they'd made different choices, if they'd done it differently. Um, so Joseph Rowntree Foundation have done a huge piece of research around this in the last few years and around the language that is used. And um, if, if you want to look at that, go onto their website and they do talk. So you'll notice, I've noticed Satvat saying that about people being pushed, pushed into poverty, because that shows that something else is pushing them driving them into it it's not their own fault it's not a choice um, and it's not foolish decision making it's not wild living it's not living outside their budget in fact I've never met people who can budget better um, and, and so actually the language that is used in journalism is critical in how the blame is laid and then that's critical how and then how society we begin to think about how it should be addressed and responded to Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, you know, we were all just agreeing with each other. Um, maybe we should have had a wee bit more conflict, I don't know. Um, but one, one thing I would add is I think it, it can be incredibly frustrating to see uh, well rebutted economic myths be repeated by the mainstream media in order, in, in a way that buttresses the arguments of austerity politics, of more conservative economic policy making. So the sort of unquestioned acceptance of the Bank of England's, uh, you know, announcement on interest rates, or the unquestioned acceptance that, oh, we're going to have to pay back this big bill from the pandemic. You know, a lot of these things that, we re that, that gets repeated in the media without much critical analysis of them or without catching up to where economics is now or any sort of heterodox economics. Um, and then the second thing I would say, you know, related to what Sapa and, and Jackie was saying is uh, one of the things that, that, you know, really fizzles my chips in coverage of this is this uh, expectation that poor people deserve the, the, the sheer minimum to be able to survive. You know, there was a reason that it's bread and roses, you know, we deserve to eat, but we also deserve beautiful things. And so this this absolute austerity of economics, but austerity of life and of humanity as well. You know, I, I, I want to like, I, I wish, you know, we didn't have this totally race to the bottom of, of how, how, how little you know, working class people should have when really we, we should be looking for, you know, a sustainable abundance for people, a sustainable, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful, art-filled life for people, whether they live in a scheme or not. Mm. That's great. Ali, do you have anything to add? Uh, not a lot. I think everyone's, uh, if I just agree with everyone, to continue the agreeing that everyone's been doing. But <laughs> I think uh, to an extent, sometimes the media reports on stuff like this, uh, like it comes out of a clear blue sky so it's like oh suddenly look loads of people are struggling or and they kind of dip in and then they dip out and then you know deal with it again when it becomes something that's more um and i think katie's right about the um, 
the idea that you know, there's people talk about the Overton window and this, you know, mainstream policy shifting. And I think the more that austerity became a sort of became a sort of standardized position of a lot of the media. Like, oh, we're in, we're in austerity, everyone's gonna have to tighten their belts. And so you get into a situation where, yeah, it, it, we, we do end up talking about these these like ludicrously low minimums of of standards of living, rather than talking about it more as like, okay, everybody in this, and it sounds really glib to say, but everyone in society should have a fulfilled life in all, all sorts of ways. So it's like, for example, things like um, arts tuition and uh, music and things is the first thing to get cut and the last thing to get brought back. We've written about that in the past um, a fair few times. Um, and, you know, things like local libraries and all this, there's, you know, the things that constantly uh, are talked about, but these are part, these are kind of parts of making people have a richer fulfilling life that everybody deserves. And it's not some sort of e added extra that's, you know, <laughs> that is uh, just added on but when, if you've got time and if you've got the inclination. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your contributions. Um, I want to remind everybody that you can read all of the investigations of the series on the uh, Ferret website that you can see here. Uh, let me bring it up. Um, you can, we have in uh, both, both part of the series, which you can find collected together in a box, but also lots of other investigations and the work of the ferret in general. Um, you might want to go have a look at that uh, at theferret.scot. Um, let me bring that back. Um, and yep, social media, all of the things, we, we're going to keep on this topic over the next couple of days, but there will also be follow-ups and newsletters and all sorts of content that you don't want to miss as we go. Um, I've learned today that I, I want to use the phrase fizzle my chips more often. I will... I will practice it in the mirror, um, but it's been a pleasure to talk to all of you folks. I learned a lot from, from this conversation, and yeah, hopefully we can do a follow-up at some point in the near future. Thanks for everyone for watching, and have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.